Hey, good evening to you folks. It's good to see you and it's good to be seen by you. Uh, this is your Master of Ceremonies, Phil Silly, bidding you good evening. And to my left, I have the Master of Disaster, the Ayatollah of Rock and Roll himself. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome my co host, Kyle Schuant, reporting hey, from an undisclosed location deep in the heart of Australia. <laughs> Kyle, how the heck are you? Oh yeah, good, good. I, I guess um, undisclosed location. This this could be a bunker, as far as you guys know. Exactly. I've had people say that it looks like I'm sitting in a missile silo here. So for all you guys know, <laughs> that's it. I'm over here in Kilo Capsule. He's over there in Charlie Capsule, and we're just we're waiting for the orders, man, to get those keys out of the <laughs> locker over there. Or maybe we're just two middle-aged nerds talking about role-playing <laughs> games on the internet. I'm going to leave it up to you, the audience, to decide. <laughs> but anyway, how are you, my friend? Good, good. I've just been uh, reading a uh, good old Stanislaw Lem, Siberiad, with my uh, with my son. And, uh, um, I mean, it's very uh, European kind of humor. Like, in the first story... So the stories are about these great constructors, they're inventors. Yeah. And uh, in the first story, Trill, the constructor, who is usually the kind of dumber of the two, um, who comes up with stupid ideas and they don't quite show, uh, turn out the way he expected. Um, Trill, the constructor, decides to make the greatest thinking machine that ever was. Uh, and... You know, he makes it yeah, eight stories tall and it has it's full of valves and circuits and machinery and um, and all the rest. And then he turns it on and he decides to, that he's going to have a break for the day. Uh, and uh, But as it, it says, as is customary on such occasions, he decides to open up with asking, what is two plus two? Okay. And the machine rumbles and and rages inside all this journey of gears and all the rest. And it then says in a deep voice, seven. And he's like, oh. so he climbs back inside and he gets out his wrench and his hammer and he starts, he come, and then he comes out hours later and he, ah, oh, that should fix it. And he's walking out to go home and he thinks, I better check. So he turns around and asks it, what is two plus two? And it turns through again and says, seven. And it goes on like this. And so his, his friend, Klopalsius, of course, makes fun of him for making such a machine. And and he invites, because he invites Klopalsius around to, to try to fix it. And Trill gets very upset with the machine. And when it keeps giving the wrong answers, he kicks it. And when it says, you know, don't kick me, show me some respect, he kicks it again more viciously. <laughs> And he gets very angry with it. So the machine pulls itself out of its mountings and starts chasing Trill and Kalpalsius around and storms through a town and that. And um, they end up running into a valley and, uh, and and climbing into a cave somewhere and it uh, falls off a cliff and smashes into smithereens. So <laughs> the greatest thinking machine ever constructed turned out to be stupid. And not just stupid, but stubbornly stupid. Stubbornly stupid. I have often said that the first step to creating artificial intelligence is to create artificial stupidity. <laughs> you know? Well, you evidently, uh, Stanislaw Lem agreed with you. You switch on a machine that immediately knows everything, man. You, you've got nothing but trouble. But turn on a machine that's got to learn. That's, <laughs> that's, that's got to take its time to learn things. You know, that's that that that's how you don't wind up with Skynet or or, you know, at the very best, something like with folded hands, which is a creepy enough story by itself. But um, that that sounds that sounds like a real pip. Um, I, I tell you what, it is one of the tragedies of the uh, of the ordinary science fiction reader. And listen, I am not. I, I am not holding myself up like some extremely well-read, you know, like, oh, no, I, if, if it's, you know, I go all the way back to the second century. There was a Greek author. Uh, one of his few surviving works is arguably the first science fiction story 
ever written. It's space travel, battle between galactic empires and everything like that. Um, I've never read it. It sounds crashingly boring. Um, <laughs> but I will say this. If you're a light science fiction reader, like, you know, maybe Star Wars or Star Trek novels and that sort of thing. Uh, and I don't know if you have read it, Kyle, but do yourself a favor and track down a copy of this, uh, the Strugatsky brothers roadside picnic. Have, yeah. have you read that one? Never heard of it. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. So roadside picnic is where, uh, stalker, uh, comes from, uh, although, uh, both the film and the video game concept, uh, the idea is that there is an extra temporal, an extraordinary event that happens around the world in set places, and it creates zones of alienation. And in these zones, the laws of physics, in many different ways, have ceased to function properly. And it's discovered through trial and error that within these zones, um, there are pathways. And if you know what to look for, you can find the pathways into the zones and you can recover what are referred to as artifacts. And an artifact, uh, when the, the book kind of begins in media rest where this event has happened some many years in the past, the UN has stepped up and created, has cordoned off the zones. Uh, the book actually, despite having been written in this in the USSR, concerns a zone uh, just outside Toronto. Um, there's one in America. It's suspected that there are some at the bottom of the sea. And what they, um, what it's determined is, is that it, it was a series of, of pulses of unknown energy or power that originated in some distant star system at a specific frequency. And as the earth rotated, it created this straight line pattern across the globe. And so, you know, they can more or less figure it out, but the artifacts that they find in the zone, some of them are just wonders of science and technology. They don't know how they function. They don't know why they function. It's um, like uh, most cars, by the time the book comes around, uh, m most higher-end cars are are powered by a, um, and I can't remember the name of the artifact, but it, it's about the diameter and length of an unsharpened pencil. And no one knows why, but if you put it in proximity of an electric motor, the electric motor just goes. So you carry around one of these on a keychain, you get in your car, you slot it in the dash, and you take off. Um, well, there there are individuals who in they, they've just got a gut feeling, an instinctive, innate sense of where the safe paths to walk through zones are. And they're they call them stalkers. Now, stalker in this context of the 1960s. Uh, translates from Russian and it means hunter, not creepy person who, you know, tries <laughs> to steal your nudes off your iPhone. Um, well, it used to it used to mean something like that anyway, because you talk about doing a, a deer stalk. Yeah, yeah the, just, the, the deer stalk. You wanted to have non-consensual relations with a deer. It just, <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe some did, but we don't talk about that. Um, so. Uh, so the book centers around uh, a, a, a stalker, a Canadian uh, guy with the name of Red. He's a young man. And <clears throat> he earns all these lauds and accolades for his, his stalking ability, his, his innate sense of being able to go into the zone and successfully lead people. And one of the, the big iconic things is he carries bolts in a pouch around his around his waist and he ties bits of string to them and he'll throw a bolt ahead of him and like if it just freezes in midair and drifts to the ground like a feather he knows that is an anomaly 
and they need to go to the left or to the right of it because if they walk through it, you know, they could be squashed down to like hamburger patty thickness, <clears throat> or they could walk through it and seemingly nothing happened. And then, you know, three days later when they're having dinner, all of their internal organs erupt out of their ears or just, <laughs> uh, I, I won't spoil the ending. It is, it is a damn fine science fiction novel. Probably one of the best I've ever written. Definitely one of the best I've ever read, but, uh, uh, the brothers Strugatsky were very critical of the Soviet system. Uh, so the book is, is a, is a subtle send up of government interference of, of communism as practiced by the Soviets. Um, but, uh, it, it's, it, it, it's, uh, the, the, um, the title Roadside Picnic, that much I will spoil for you because a scientist giving an interview, there's a lot of fun false documents in it. And so the beginning of the chapter is an excerpt from an interview in Life magazine with a scientist who studies the zone. And he says, okay, imagine you're driving out in the country and your car breaks down and you got your family with you and your friends with you in the car. So you pull off. And everybody says, well, let's have a picnic. And you get the blanket out and the food and they're eating and, you know, you and your friends are working on the car and watching from the brush are the rabbits, the squirrels, the birds, foxes, and so on. And they're terrified and fascinated at what you're doing. You're not doing anything harmful to them. Um, you know, maybe you pour out engine oil on the ground, you know, you poison the ground, but uh, you don't think anything of it. But you leave, you know, a hubcap behind some nuts and bolts, uh, a wind up toy of the child's, uh, you know, containers that food was in and so on. And you pack up and you drive on. Well, after you've gone, the animals come out and they're confronted with these items that are completely beyond their understanding. They have no idea what this is to you. It's just discards. It's cast offs. You don't care about it. To them, it is, these are devices of the gods, you know, and you've created a spot in their environment where nothing grows anymore and they don't dare go. They don't try and dig for, for food there. So that's the, the roadside picnic. And it inspired the whole, uh, uh, the video game series stalker and, um, the, uh, um, a, a lot of the terminology from the book before the video game series came out, um, because it was very, very popular in the USSR, uh, like the uh, tour guides, uh, whether government authorized or not, who would take people into the, the uh, Chernobyl exclusion zone, which came to be called the zone of alienation, got given the nickname stalkers mm. because the, you know they'd be like okay that strawberry patch over there with a rusting russian military truck in it yeah if we walk five feet closer to that we're going to be getting a, a lethal dose of radiation so we're just <laughs> we're, we're going to give that a wide berth. so do read stalker if you haven't it should be available it might even be available for free online but look for a pay copy because the stragatskis okay. definitely deserve your money Okay, well, you know, so this this guy was a uh, Polish writer, mm -hmm. um, and uh, he didn't inspire travel or anything like that in any way whatsoever. <laughs> uh, but um, uh, but the sci-fi is still good. One of the things Trill and Kapalshius do is uh, they they go out and they travel among the stars and they offer their services to people in the other world to develop their technology, and. Uh, <clears throat> they um, they said uh, when they're about to go to a new world. They said, "What if we go to the new world, and the guys there just want us to make war technology?" That often happens. <laughs> and they go, oh, "Okay, we'll do the gargantuous effect," and that's that's the um, the uh, the story that that's there, the gargantuous effect, uh, where they uh, basically say that the, um, the the problem with soldiers is they don't always obey their leaders' orders perfectly. 
And the problem with leaders is that they're not always smart enough to give the right orders. So what we have to do is put a put a plug in each guy's chest and plug him into the next guy, and then we'll get more intelligent and more, the group intelligence will be greater than the, the individual intelligence and the group obedience will be greater still. Um, and as they join them together, they uh, start to become more pacifist. <laughs> <laughs> So I don't know whether, um, like it says, you know, once a, a company joined up, in, several companies joined up into a battalion, they just started chasing butterflies because they developed an <laughs> aesthetic sense. <laughs> and another battalion went off and just started painting and stuff. And I don't know whether um, Senator Lem was making fun of uh, warmongering dictators or whether he was making fun of um, a pacifist, the, the sort of that kind of Western intellectuals idea that, uh, you know, if you are having a more intelligent and more evolved sensibilities, of course, you will be more artistic and, and pacifist. An intelligent person could never possibly want war. That's just for lesser folk, you know. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know which he was making fun of. Being European, probably both. Um, so that's what they do in the end. And then the two armies join together and there's no war and everything. But uh, the descriptions of um, the leaders, I think, He's surely thinking of various uh, Soviet leaders. The kingdom to which Trill repaired was ruled by King, King Atrocitus. <laughs> he was a militarist to the core and an incredible miser besides. To relieve the royal treasury, he did away with all punishments except for the death sentence. His favourite occupation was to abolish unnecessary offices. Since that included the office of executioner, every condemned citizen was obliged to do his own beheading or else on rare occasions of royal clemency, have it done by his next of kin. Of the arts, Atrocitus supported only those that entailed little expense, such as choral recita recitation, recitation, chess, and military calisthenics. The art of war he held in particularly high esteem, for a victorious campaign brought in excellent returns. On the other hand, one could properly prepare for war only during an interval of peace, so the king advocated peace, though in moderation. <laughs> His greatest reform was the nationalization of high treason. As the neighboring kingdom was continually sending spies, he created the office of royal informer, who, through a staff of subordinate traitors, would hand over state secrets to enemy agents for certain sums of money. Though as a rule, the agents purchased only outdated secrets, those were less expensive, and besides, they were held accountable to their own treasury for every penny spent. <laughs> <laughs> So it goes on like that. Um, so I think someone was taking the piss out of some uh, certain dictators out there. Um, but yeah, so th this one did make me think of Traveller because <coughs> uh, they describe a, a spacecraft. Now, in 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 the real world, uh, form follows function, right? A, a particular object will be usually a particular uh, shape because it has to be to accomplish its purpose, right? There's there's only so many ways that you can shape a knife and it's still a useful knife. Only so many ways you could shape a screwdriver and it's still a useful screwdriver and so on. Um, likewise with spacecraft. So that's why your Apollo spacecraft, you, you, the ones that have to re-enter the Earth's atmosphere tend to be either that sort of flat cone shape like the Apollo one or mm -hmm. a round shape like the, the Soyuz, you know, uh, you can have a glider come back, but it's going to be, you know, definitely an unpowered descent. So you have the glider like the space shuttle, you know. Um, on the other hand, the one that landed on the moon was this very strange shape that nobody can describe, <laughs> the uh, the moon lander, because right. it, it wasn't going in an atmosphere, so it could be any shape that anyone wanted. It could be an odd shape. Um, <clears throat> now, this applies to Traveller because, so uh, then, again, again, subjecting myself to the pain so that the rest of you don't have to i was looking at the the traveler forums um oh, poor man <laughs> and uh they were discussing back and forth uh, because one of the things that came up in um in the later editions past uh, books one to three was the idea of reactionless drive so you know you're not you're not sending exhaust out the back the laws of conservation and momentum don't apply you're, you're you're not sending stuff out the back to make you go forwards so, you know, you've got your Millennium Falcon or your TIE fighter. It just goes in in order to fly. Um, it's a, a, there's no reaction mass going out the back. 
as well, these things, even if you didn't have to worry about reaction mass, you would have to worry about heat as well. Because, uh, so for example, the uh, the ship Rossinante in uh, Expanse, um, one guy's calculated going on what's in the books, what sort of drive it would have. And it's one of these ones that's scientifically possible, but we don't have the engineering yet. So it, it rates pretty high on the scientific hard scale. We don't know if it would ever be possible to make it work, like uh, a fusion reactor. In theory, it should work. Can we make it work? That that's another matter. Mm, yeah. Anyway, um, <clears throat> so but the Rossinanti, he he uh, calculated the engine would have an output of ninety six point eight terawatts. By comparison, the entire energy output of the human race at the moment is eighteen terawatts. So <laughs> one spaceship would have five times that. <laughs> That's a lot, a lot of heat that it's got to get rid of. That is a the, it, it's going to get a little warm. It's yeah. going to get wear, wear so, your short pants on that mission. Wear your short pants if you can, guys. Um, so uh, now in the case of the Ross and Andy, most of it's going out in exhaust or neutron radiation and everything, so it's not an issue. Um, in the books, they do mention uh, radiators and stuff. So for a realistic spacecraft, you've got to have radiators. The International Space Station has heat radiators that it puts mm -hmm. out uh, to let out the heat from uh, life support. But in Traveller, in the later editions anyway, they don't worry about that. <laughs> There's no radiators. The heat goes um, somewhere. Somewhere, yes. <clears throat> now, so if you don't have to... So then I read this passage in, in Lem's book, um, about a spacecraft landing, and it got me thinking of this. Um, so, uh, Clopalcius and uh, Trill, they uh, they want to go and help another king again. So they arrange the stars. Um, they arrange the stars to make a sign in the sky, saying, two distinguished con constructors seek employment commensurate with their skill, and above all, lucrative. Hence, preferably at the court of a well-heeled king, should have his own kingdom." Terms to be arranged. It was not long before, one bright morning, a most marvellous craft alighted on their front lawn. It gleamed in the sun, all inlaid with mother of pearl, had three legs intricately carved, and six additional supports of solid gold. They're quite useless since they didn't even reach the ground. But then the builders obviously had more wealth than they knew what to do with. Down a magnificent staircase with billowing fountains on either side, there came a figure of stately bearing with a retinue of six-legged machines. Some of these massaged him, some supported him and fanned him, and the smallest flew above his august brow and sprayed it with eau de cologne from an atomizer. This impressive emissary greeted the constructors on behalf of his lord and sovereign, King Cruel, who wished to engage them. Um, if you don't have to worry about heat and reaction mass and you don't have to worry about form following function, you can have a spacecraft inlaid with mother of pearl and with gold supports. And that when the ramp comes down, it, there's fountains that start and that you can have that. It's sure. so it doesn't have to look like that uh, type a free trader that you had in the, uh, in the screenshot a week or two back right. in the thumbnail a week or two back. It doesn't have to look like that. And I think that's what uh, David Lynch's Dune captured so wonderfully with the guild highliners. I mean, it's just, there's a point at which, you know, why not make the kilometer high door look like a Roman colonnade, Yeah, you know, on the side of the spaceship. Uh, we, we, we have the budget necessary to run a galaxy. So I think, I think we can swing that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, you know, um, that's, that's the thing. Once you start tossing aside the laws of physics, you can have all sorts of funky stuff. So I think uh, people really have not gone far enough into this. They really have not gone far enough into this. If you're going to you know, toss it aside, then you can be really super creative in your spaceship oh, yeah. design and that. Oh, yeah. Uh, but I could I could just imagine sitting down with some of those uh, traveler guys on posting on the forums with them as game master and saying, well, since I'm designing my own starship and I have to pay for it, and since there's no reaction mass and since there's no heat to worry about, I want mother of pearl all across it. <laughs> <laughs> and I want fountains when the ramp opens up. <laughs> I love it. I absolutely love it. 
Like the heart and of I gold. I just imagine they it's like, ah, no, but that's wrong. It doesn't make sense. I'm like, well, you know, you've chosen to go that route. If you've chosen to go the route of it not making sense, why not have the spacecraft inlaid with Mother of Pearl and shaped like, I don't know, a teacup and saucer? Why not have the the McDonald's in the dungeon? Why not? You know, <laughs> if sure. you're going to go that way, what the hell? <laughs> you know, the... my personal taste is for more realistic themed, but you know, same, same. But I'm not going to turn my nose up if you want to have a little bit of fun. Um, <laughs> a little bit of fun. No, no. <laughs> No, no barista D and D, no, <laughs> no barista D and D. But that wouldn't be fun. That would be just pretty boring. Yes. Uh, so I, you talking about um, Lem's story of of Patriots of Warlock? It immediately brought something. I cannot for a minute think that Lem did not read this short story by Ambrose Bierce, the ingenious Patriot. Have, have you heard of it? No. It's literally just a couple of paragraphs. I want to share this with you. Um, but I think you'll get a kick out of it. It's a, it, it is effectively a science fiction story. I first read this in uh, 101 great short, short science fiction stories. That's the actual name of the book. And it is a rarity. I've talked about it on the show way back a couple of years ago. Um, it has the only occurrence of one particular story of Larry Niven's known space in it. For example, it has a story by George R. R. Martin. Um, and they're they're all great zingers. I think the longest one is like three and one quarter pages long, but this one is not. This is The Ingenious Patriot by Ambrose Beers. Having obtained an audience of the king of an ingenious patriot... Uh, now, let me try that again. Having obtained an audience of the king, an ingenious patriot pulled out a paper from his pocket saying, May it please your majesty, I have here a formula for constructing armor plating which no gun can pierce. If these plates are adopted in the Royal Navy, our warships will be invulnerable and therefore invincible. Here also are reports of your majesty's ministers attesting to the value of the invention. I will part with it I will part with my right in it for a million tum-tums. After examining the papers, the king put them away and promised him an order on the High Lord Treasurer of the Extortion Department for a million tum-tums. And here, said the ingenious patriot, pulling another paper from another pocket, are the working plans of a gun which I have invented, which will pierce that armor. Your majesty's royal brother, the emperor of Bang, is anxious to purchase, but loyalty to your majesty's throne and person constrains me to offer it to your majesty first. The price is one million tum-tums. Having received the promise of another check, he thrust his hand into still another pocket, remarking, the price of the irresistible gun would have been much greater, your majesty, but for the fact that its missiles can be so effectively averted by my peculiar method of treating the armor plates with a new... The king signed for the he great head factorum to approach. Search this man, he said, and report how many pockets he has. Forty-three, sire, said the great head factorum, completing the scrutiny. May it please your majesty, cried the ingenious patriot in terror. One of them contains tobacco. Hold him up by the ankles and shake him, said the king. Then give him a check for 42 million tum-tums and put him to death. Let a decree issue declaring ingenuity a capital offense. <laughs> it never pays to be a smart ass. <laughs> I'm reminded of um, there was a Billy Connolly skit, a Billy Con Connolly skit, where he said, uh, "Nuclear weapons salesman, that must be a great job." He said, "You, you got oh, there's this thing. It's going to kill every bastard." You know, it's going to kill everyone, mate. It's great. It's great. And he said, and it doesn't matter if it works or not. It could be filled with donuts. Who would know? Yeah. <laughs> and because if they, they will never complain either. Because if they try to use it and kill every bastard and it doesn't work, they won't want to tell anyone, will they? <laughs> so. <laughs> Truly, uh, the, the, the the comment on the reality of our time is is that it's just that I mean, you know what's sitting on top of all of our uh, of our LGM one eighteen peacemaker missiles, 
probably one of the most ironically named weapon systems we've ever invented. Um, you know, the donuts, like you say, it's it, when Arnold's <laughs> looking at the uh, the SS 18 warhead and true lies, you know, I know what this is. This is a snow cone machine. It might as well be. <laughs> Maybe uh, maybe that's why the countries have been so reluctant to get into uh, um, you know, elimination of nuclear weapons because that would require inspections and people might find out how few working ones they actually have. <laughs> yeah, they start cracking open the warheads of uh, a B-63 general purpose free fall bombs and find out that like that's where all the socks went. <laughs> you're losing your dryer. The Air Force has been collecting them and stuffing them. And in, in Russia, it's just nesting dolls. We take the warhead cone off. There's a smaller. Yeah, yeah. There, cone. there was yeah. a um, there was a little a, a little meme of um, the, the new Russian tank that you open it up and find it a smaller tank inside. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so I gotta this. Unfortunately, this won't play great on camera. I don't know if I can even reach it. Yes, I can. Um, so I've been three D printing some one one hundred scale Cold War era vehicles for uh, a proper like coherent twilight 2000 play demo and this unfortunately again this will not look great on camera um this is an abrams tank printed at one 100th scale uh and it's you know it's about three inches long uh about an inch and a half high you know it, it looks the part it looks the part so I go and I, I start to print this one out I'd already printed out a, t uh, a Russian T90 tank let me reach over and get I printed out a Russian T90 tank and I was like, okay, all right. So let me, let me print this out. And it prints out this T90 little thing. And I'm looking at the Abrams and I'm looking at the Russian tank and I'm like, there's something <laughs> wrong. I I've screwed up my settings. Clearly I need to go in and I'm printing another Abrams. Cause you know, you got to have more than one. Um, and I, I, no, 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 no. I'm, I stopped the print. You know, I scrapped the, it's like got half the plastic is filled out on the print thing and I pry it off and I go to the software and I'm like, all right, okay. So let's see, it's 7.93 meters long. That's 79.3 millimeters. Yeah, it's 79. Okay. But the Russian tank must be too small then, you know, it's 6.23 meters. So that's 62.3 mil. No, it's a, so I, I went ahead and printed it and I took a I took a picture of it and I put it on the Twilight 2000 forum and I'm like, what am I doing wrong with my printer settings? And people are like, nothing. The tanks are really that disproportionate. The, the Russian <laughs> tank, like you can stand on the 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 top of the turret of an M1 tank and be looking way down into where <laughs> the the T90 tank is. They're small. They're small. They're SM all small. So yeah, you could do the nesting tank trick. Um, well, doesn't um, don't the Russian ones after the T seventy two or something have no loader? They've just got an automatic loader. Yeah. So back in when they introduced the T sixty two series, um, they said, okay, well, uh, three crewmen. Smaller tank, smaller target, more armor, automatic loader. Mm. But, uh, but it takes people's arms off, though, doesn't it? It, it? it is notorious for catching clothes and hands <laughs> and such. Um, it, it got better as the years went on because the T-62 came out in uh, in, in the, the 1960s. I put a um, bit of black and yellow tape next to the, yeah, the oh, some hazard stripes, you know, <laughs> next touch, keep your hands out. <laughs> um so so yeah the uh but you know because you have both been there and 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 did that when you have a unit that has x number of people in it whether it's a squad a platoon a company or even something as small as a vehicle crew if doctrinally you take one of them away everything you have to do to keep that vehicle running just got 25% harder. Mm -hmm. And you've added another mechanical subsystem, the auto loader. So yeah, the, the, the Russians, I think, uh, 
I don't want to say that they didn't think it through, but they just didn't think in the same direction, perhaps, that we might have. Um, have a good evening, Dutch Minister. Um, but yeah, the 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 T sixty two, T sixty four, T seventy two, T eighty, T ninety, T ninety five are notorious for two things. One, like literally in the Russian army, they will say you're too tall to be a tanker. <laughs> oh, you're you're two meters tall. Well, I thought that so was I thought that was every army. Is it? I I, I honestly no, I because so, um I, I remember um uh, Arnold Squashenegger uh, writing about how he wasn't he was too tall for um he was in an armored unit and he was too tall for it uh but he was able to get into it because his uh, father was chief of police of the town so mm. he, and he had and the armored unit was the closest one in the town he wanted to be able to go home on weekends and that sort of thing ah. so um. Yeah, so his father got him into that unit, even though he was supposedly too tall. He actually he didn't ended up not spending much time in tanks anyway, uh, because one weekend he wanted to go to the European Bodybuilding Championships, which was uh, in Munich or something, and he applied for leave and they wouldn't get give it to him, so he just snuck out. <laughs> <laughs> he snuck out for the weekend and then he came back and nobody noticed until somebody was reading the newspaper. And they said, Bra's <laughs> native Arnold Schwarzenegger has won the <laughs> championships. <laughs> and so then they, they put him in the brig for a few days to punish him. And then when they took him out, they said, all right. All right, Schwarzenegger, if you are going to lift, you must lift for the army. <laughs> so for half a day, you will work on the tanks. And then for half a day, you will lift weights. And so they got this they got this spare room that they had and they filled it with all the weights that they had just randomly from across the base and that. And he said it was one of the best periods of training he'd had in his life because he never rested because he'd be resting between sets, sitting there. And some sergeant would walk past and go, hey, Schwarzenegger, you should be lifting. <laughs> and go, oh, let's get back to it. <laughs> um yeah, so I don't know how much time he spent in his tank, but um, I do I do know that he um, went years later. He went back and he found that particular tank and he he purchased it and he took it over to the United States. It, so um, it's kind of weird. Uh, there there was a gentleman, uh, and I know I'm screwing his name up. If any, if you know over in the chat, please correct me on this, but I believe it was Larry Ellison of Oracle. It was one of the founders of Oracle. Uh, the, uh, it, people talk about Microsoft and Apple and they don't really understand Oracle was a Titanic. Like in the heyday of Apple and Microsoft in the 90s, they didn't get a tan because Oracle was still blotting out the sun, but you don't use Oracle on your computer. Oracle doesn't do anything on your PC. You know, everybody heard about windows 95. Everybody heard about the first iMac. Um, but there was Oracle basically powering every database in the country and may still be, but the guys who ran Oracle got insanely rich. And one of them liked tanks as a hobby and he built a museum in Northern California, the M, I'm going to mess this up, but it's MTVF, Military Technology Vehicle Foundation, or maybe it was Military Vehicle Technology Foundation. But anyway, uh, it was in the 90s after the Cold War, after the Gulf War. So he set about to purchase as many publicly available armored fighting vehicles as he could. Now, I'm not talking about eccentric rich guy has a Sherman tank because there's plenty of those all over the United States <laughs> um, or, you know, local farmer buys an M8 Greyhound because his grandpappy served in one in, in World War II. No, this guy had an armored brigade's worth of vehicles <laughs> basically in his garage and they were all operational. Um most of the guns were were breech cut. That is, they, they had a specific cut in them. So if you did find 
120 millimeter round to put in and and pull the lanyard it would blow the gun apart and end your life but there was one he had an a pristine undamaged uh 88 from a a uh, a tiger 2 he he paid the the it was manufactured before 1984 and he paid the yearly destructive device tax for it to the the bureau of alcohol tobaccos and firearm which it shouldn't be a government bureau because that sounds like a hell of a weekend alcohol tobacco and firearms <laughs> but um so he had one operational 88 gun as far as i know he didn't have any ammunition for it but he um uh, he um he passed away from cancer and his family appreciated what he did they were not quite as enthusiastic about maintaining it. <laughs> and the question really became, because it was on private property, you know, a tank, and I'm sure you probably know this better than I do, and maybe some of our viewers do too. Um, they're very neat to look at, you know, they're, they're, but like climbing on one and getting down in one and sitting in one, you realize that they're really filthy, uncomfortable, dangerous things. You know, it's like, oh, well, just step down in there. Oh, okay. Well, I caught my nuts on the, uh, on the, uh, the breach recoil mechanism. And now I'm singing soprano. Um, cause. And they have to be constantly maintained. And very, the, oh my God. Yes. Uh, like, yeah. well, I, I, um, haven't been in a, in, um, a tank. I've been in armored personnel carriers in one thirteens and they're just like, even with constant maintenance, I mean, these were old, but. Um, even with constant maintenance, they're just like riddled with rust and and, ru and yeah. rubber seals peeling from walls and stuff like that. And, yeah, you know they don't like it. They they like that fucking. Everyone's had that girlfriend at some point in their life who's like, I'm. It's hot. Oh, now I'm too cold. It's like <laughs> she's always uncomfortable yeah. and it's always the wrong temperature. She's always complaining. That's what armored vehicles are like. <laughs> it's, yes. it's never quite right. Um, so they basically have been over the years, they've been selling off their collection. And what this has to do with Schwarzenegger is, uh, his vehicle of choice when he was in Austria, uh, was the M 47, a U.S. built medium battle tank of its time, a 1950s era tank. And he bought at least one, possibly two M 47s from the uh the the foundation i'll just call it the foundation uh and i remember a number of years ago he had uh all proceeds to charity to special olympics he's a big supporter of special olympics and i think that's awesome but uh you could win a weekend with arnie and destroy stuff yeah basically anything you wanted to <laughs> smash they would set it out and he would he would let you drive over it or drive over it for you or with you in the tank and uh, I, I, th I thought that was pretty neat, but it was his model of tank from his days in mm -hmm. Austria. And you're right. He did get the, the S, how oh, was it? The SK-105? I think it was, I think that was the model tank, too, that he served on in Austria. He did get his SK-105. So he has that and two M47s. So, folks, if you're thinking about breaking into Arnold Schwarzenegger's property out in California... <laughs> Ignoring the fact that that would be suicidally dangerous because the man could peel you like a banana. Um, <laughs> he has three main battle tanks and the know-how to use them. I'm not them. that scared of uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger. He, I mean, it, on, on Instagram, he's always posting pictures of himself with his pet Shetland pony. I'm that sorry. That Shetland pony is adorable. <laughs> I'm sorry, but no man is a badass murdering bastard <laughs> if he has a pet Shetland, Shetland pony. Don't tell John Wick you're you're uh, not a hard ass murdering bastard if you have a pet. Um, but then John Wick has a dog, not a Shetland pony. So, <laughs> but anyway, the point I was I was gonna you were, you were talking about like the size of people in armored vehicles. Uh, there's a guy who's got a great YouTube channel, and he's actually been to the foundation a few times. And his, his name is Nicholas Moran. He is an Irish American. I mean, as in was born in and grew up in and lived in Ireland until he joined the United States Armed Forces. Um, received a commission which qualified him for 
U.S. citizenship, so he holds dual U.S. Irish citizenship. Um, he is six foot two. He's as tall as I am. And he goes to museums and finds armored vehicles and plays a game with the viewers called uh, Oh Bugger, the Tank is on Fire, <laughs> where he will cram himself into a fighting position in one of the tanks. And understand, he's gotten into tanks that are smaller than compact cars. Like the U.S. had a very ill-conceived and poorly performing tank in World War II called the Locust that is smaller than my Volkswagen Tiguan. Um, <laughs> and he folded himself into it, into the driver's position. And with a camera outside, it's, it's like that scene with Matthew Broderick in Lady Hawk when he's escaping the dungeons of Aquila and he's got like one arm and his face pushed through a hole in the wall. And he says, rather like escaping mother's womb. God, what a memory. So he's, he's literally like climbing out of the tank to see like if the tanks hit and it starts to burn, can my six foot four self unfold my way out of it? Um, and the one Abrams tank, the single solitary example of an Abrams tank that is in a museum in the United States. Uh, he, they, they invited him to come and the inside of that thing, Kyle is huge. <laughs> he's just like, he's sitting there like this. Cause he crewed one. He was a, he was a tank commander when he came to the United States. Cause Ireland has like, I think when he joined the army, they had like eight armored vehicles. So your, your odds of getting to be an armored vehicle crewman in Ireland are, are, are diminishingly small. So he joined the U S army to, to, to do more stuff with tanks. Um, and he crewed an M one, not that particular M one, but he's kind of giving the viewers a guided tour of it. And he's just lounging around in the thing. <laughs> like, you play handball in an Abrams turret. Good Lord. It is a big, big tank. So when I printed these up, I was like, surely to God, I'm, I'm measuring this wrong. Or, the, you know, it's 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 some different. Maybe it's 1-100 metric and I'm doing 1-100 English. I didn't, you know, because I, I was getting like a Hot Wheels car size thing. And then this thing, the size of a computer mouse. I didn't know what was going on. Armored vehicles care not for your physical comfort or cell reception. That is very true. Although he does tell of a fun trick they did. There's an intercom system, of course, in, in tanks. And gunnery practice is not simply a matter of, guys, today we're taking track 66 to the gunnery range. We're going to fire eight Sabo, eight Heat, uh, uh, two programmable rounds, rip off some 50 cal, pull maintenance, and then that's our day. It's, we get up at 0530 and get in a line because the rest of the company is doing it. And, you know, maybe they get a jam on the 50 cal. Maybe, you know, the, the range safety coordinator wants to stop that tank crew and dress them down for a safety violation. Or... The motto of militaries worldwide is hurry up and wait. Exactly. So you might be sitting out there doing nothing, waiting for your turn along with three other tanks because there's, you know, platoons in front of you for hours. So what they figured out was take a cheap pair of headphones, chop the headphones off, get a spare, uh, basically a spare uh, CVC uh, communication headset uh, wire, chop the end of it off that goes into the actual headset, wire them together, plug the headphone end into your into an iPhone, and they would sit there and listen to audiobooks or music <laughs> while they just over the entire intercom. And it couldn't be heard on the radio net because it's it's just the tank intercom. So if somebody outside the tanks, uh, track 66, uh, move up to enfilade, you know, they could step on the net and say, uh, Roger that, and then get off of it and <laughs> drive forward and still listening to John Grisham or, or, you know, 
some some uh, some Katy Perry on the on the uh, intercom system or whatever. <laughs> so that 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 was uh, I always thought that was a fun story. <laughs> but anyhow, well, they'd, uh, they'd be gradually going deaf anyway from the sound of the machine and the guns. <laughs> yeah, no kidding, no kidding. Um, one of the uh, um. One of the more interesting, uh, we were talking about maintenance. I don't, I really don't want to talk about the very horrible situation that's going on in Russia right now. Uh, you know, just the absolute lunacy of what they're doing. But I will say it's a very, if I, can I say very funny folks? Can I, can I say this is funny? I think this is funny. Um, situation where they, uh, there's a, a Ukrainian man, he's driving up a highway and he pulls up next to a, a BTR, which is a big eight wheeled armored personnel carrier that lots of countries use. But this one is one of the Russian invaders BTRs. And it's just, um, uh, it, it, it's just parked by the side of the road and the crew is just kind of standing around dejectedly looking at it. And he pulls up and rolls down the window and goes, hey, hi there where are you guys from? And they're like, Oh, we're from Russia. And he's like, what's wrong. And one of the, one of the guys laughs and says, uh, Oh, uh, you know, we, we broke down. And he says the just the guys just got like brass ones, the, the, the size of, of St. Peter's cathedral. And he says, can I give you a tow back to Russia? <laughs> <laughs> and they laugh and he laugh and he drives on. There no, I go. See, I fixed it. Luther's <laughs> comment. L L Luther and I, uh, uh, Luther, what you're seeing is the same scale problem that I had with the tank miniatures. <laughs> Skyle, uh, uh, Kyle is 162 and I'm 1 100. So, <laughs> um, yeah, well, I we were discussing this earlier. Um, so there was an instance where uh, they had a, a farmer with. A, with his tractor and he had grabbed a, uh, a vehicle recovery vehicle, and I, <laughs> one of the, uh, one of the tank recovery vehicles and he's driving along the road with it. So evidently it had broken down or been abandoned by its <laughs> pieces or whatever. So not just a tank, but a recovery vehicle. That's now, as good as the fuel trucks that had to stop because they it, run out of fuel. It is. I don't know how those <clears throat> things are allocated in the Russian army, but I do know enough about I'm I'm a, I'm a military hardware nerd and I apologize for that. But I do know those are allocated on like at least in the in the states are like three on a on a tank battalion. So he literally took a, an entire tank company's ability <laughs> to get towed and just took off with it. Mm -hmm. Um, but he, I mean, he hadn't been, as far as anyone could tell, he hadn't been shot at or whatever. He just found it sitting on the road somewhere and decided to take it with him. I don't know what he's going to do with the damn thing, but <laughs> so, uh, to bring it back to the nice, pleasant fictional world of gaming, um, this, uh, it, what you were saying is, you know, don't tell me it's unrealistic to come across a, you know, an Abrams tank. In Twilight 2000, Abrams tank with just a broken track, otherwise intact, and that because uh, in, in a real conflict scenario, it, all sorts of shit is just going to get left lying around, yeah. and nobody knows why. You know, we've seen pictures of ration packs around and, and heaps of equipment and material and stuff, and who knows yeah. what happened? Where, you know, and, and and probably nobody will ever find out what happened. That's it's just the nature of the the, the chaos of a large conflict situation. Yeah. And so this probably applies to dungeons and as well. You know, if um, I'm sort of fond of the idea of the, the uh, mega dungeon with the, with this sort of ecology of it, there's a the layer of kobolds and a layer of orcs and, and all the rest, of, and how they interact over the <laughs> years. How did it come to be? I uh, in one of my campaigns, I did that. That yeah, you know, there were some caverns which with a bunch of bandits, and there was a, a dungeon attached. There was a um, there was a door that they couldn't figure out how to open and, and they'd been trying to chisel their way through it in between going out and doing their normal banditry. Mm -hmm. um, 
and this these caverns led to uh, the the actual dungeon was a uh, abandoned dwarven area. But what had happened is that orcs had come through, wiped out all the dwarves, and then over time the orcs had moved on. So it was this. So you had some orcs living in part of it, and then you had the remains of dwarves and things, and then you had undead. And then further down in the dungeon was going to be some other stuff that the players never got to that. So if you sort of think about the history of the place and the conflict, you go, well, why is this plus three sword just lying around here? I don't know. Why is this armoured recovery vehicle just lying around here? <laughs> it's, yeah. you've had, if you've had generations of conflict, uh, whether between people or, or uh, more pleasantly, between uh, you know orcs and kobolds and stuff, more pleasant because it's completely fictional, um, then you got to get this random crazy shit. <laughs> yeah, I, and I, th that's we we go we go back to to our mantra faults here uh, on the Delver's Dungeon. The dice are always right. Yeah, and you just you roll know, the dice and let it happen, and and, and players. So and you know why is there a, a, an armored recovery vehicle lying around here? Surely they wouldn't have abandoned that. Well, but to uh, to. And then some players said, but to recover an armoured recovery vehicle, you would need another armoured recovery vehicle. Maybe that's better spent recovering an, an armoured vehicle. <laughs> yeah, but instantly. <laughs> and they yeah. this whole argument around the table. And I like it when players are having those arguments around the table because it gives me a chance to um, roll up the next encounter and stuff. <laughs> gives me time. Yeah. Um, so the... Um... The thing with the, uh, you know, just just the finding of things and and how that works in AD and is is it really players and and uh, uh, dear viewers, if you're DMing and even if you're playing, I I'm not talking about like a trick to play on players this time. I'm talking about something that builds the rich richness of your world. Um, go through the Dungeon Master's Guide. Dungeon Masters. Look at all the stuff that Gary talks about is just scattered in dungeons. You know, dungeons are not these clean field stone, 10 feet wide, 10 feet high, and feet long hallways that go north, south, east, and west and turn at right angles that are clean enough to sit down and have a picnic on. He talks about exactly broken... 10 by 10. Exactly, ten by ten seconds. With like yes. Kia furniture, which is. <laughs> <laughs> I spent a good chunk of the afternoon at IKEA today. That place, that that is a hell maze. That is. Do you a need a drink now? Do, do you need? Uh, drink I, now? I may I may have to have a cold one later, but. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's a dumb. Uh, yeah. Um, it's designed it, for you to get lost in. It 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 really it really and truly is. Uh, it it is what. Uh, <laughs> Uh, pop horror writers are picking up on this lot. It's a, it's a liminal space. Except instead of except instead of moving through the dungeon and you collect money at the end, you move through this dungeon, then you pay money at the end to get yeah, out. Yeah, you lo you lose your money at the end. <laughs> um, and, and experience. I mean, if experience is measured in wisdom, you're just numb from the eyebrows up when you leave that place. So um, it's a reverse dungeon. But anyway, well, they do have um, good meatballs. I can't, I can't argue that. I can't argue that. Although it does make one wonder, you know, where the meatballs come from. And then you start to come up with the uncomfortable question of this place is so mazy. Surely some people have never made it out of here. <laughs> I'll just leave that one to your imagination. But um, the, uh, uh, the Dungeon Master's Guide talks about dungeon dressing. Uh and that is not from Hill, Hidden Valley Ranch, by the way. Um, broken pot shirts, you know, a, a, a chest mm. that, that, that's smashed in, uh, you know, a half an arrow, a, a, a dagger with a broken blade, um, you know, a, a stack of old empty wine bottles, things like that that you might think is trash. The you as the DM, I think it is incumbent on you to put those things in your dungeon because, and hear me out, your players will fill in the blanks as to why they're there, and you should be taking mental notes of that. 
not as gotchas, but just as, you know, let's go back to the potsherds. Okay. Uh, corners filled with potsherds. And you're just dungeon dressing. So you've got uh, many charts, of course, mm. air currents, slight breeze, strong wind, etc. Odors, acrid smell, putrid smell, chlorine smell, etc. Uh, air, clear, foggy, hazy. General, you can find a broken arrow, cobwebs, a bent copper coin. Where's it bent? What's going on? Um, a cracked flask, a broken sword blade. Uh, I'd hesitate to put in the broken sword blade because then they'll argue for hours over whether or not they can repair it because it might be magical. Um, wall scratchings. Who scratched on this wall? Why? Unexplained sounds and weird noises. Footsteps approaching. Slithering. Chirping, groaning, jingling. Um, by the way, this goes on for a number of pages, 217 yeah. to 220. Furnishings and appointments general, religious articles and furnishings, torture chamber furnishings, <laughs> including a grill. Time for mark, <laughs> you guys. Uh, magic user furnishings, general description of container contents, miscellaneous utensils and personal items, clothing and footwear, jewelry and items typically bejeweled, Food and drink, condiments and seasonings. Um, yeah, and a chamber room and other space li list. So you could, um, it's just a list of like chapel, cistern, uh, uh, closet, dormitory, um, solar. What's the solar? I don't know. Uh, refectory, robing room, and so on. So you, a harem, seraglio. Oh, cool. Um, so it's not just a 10 by 10 room, you know, what was it originally? Yeah. So right. Heaps there. Yeah. And, and you've got, it is again, I think incumbent on the DM, you, you know, Gary gave us these tools, fill your dungeon up with this stuff, guys. The, the, the random tank wreck need not be, you know, well, that's in twilight 2000. I can't, I can't do that in D and D, you know, Again, to go back to the pot shirts, all these broken pots in the corner. To me, the DM, well, it might be flavoring. In D &D, the it wouldn't be a random tank wreck. It would be a random set of plate armor. Yeah. Yeah, ex it, exactly. Like, like, you know, you pile that in a corner and your players, you know, are going to spend a long time. They're going to wonder about, okay, what is that? Why is it there? What do we do with that? Is it trapped? You know? And it can be a fun diversion. Um, and and your players might have... I mean, I've thrown out little things, little articles and items like that, that, you know... I, I, the bent coin. I thought that was neat. A bent copper piece. A bent copper piece? We must be near a treasury. Who would drop a coin in a dungeon and just leave it on the ground? And as an inveterate, I, guy, I had that. Stop I had that once, money. and the the players uh, thought that it was left over from trying to pick a lock or something. There you go. I mean, we'll prize something open. You know, you you can find yourselves in in good orbital resonance, if you will, with your players coming up with with ideas throwing at you. And just as the dice are always right, if we if we extrapolate that out a little bit and say the random generator is always right, well, players' thoughts on things that you're not expecting are just as, as valid a random generator as picking up a die and rolling it. So if suddenly they've got this mental image that, wait a minute, broken pot shards, a bent coin, an empty suit of armor, we think this happened here. Roll with it do it if it sounds neat and it's not going to break your your plan roll with it but if you're just like this is another 20 by 30 room anything on the floor uh, some scuff marks anything unusual about them no all right we keep walking <laughs> i mean you could have your character's power walk your entire dungeon in the space of 45 minutes and you know you've got a three hour time slot at the comic store or or you had planned three hours to game at your house that night. So dress your dungeons. Put an abandoned Abrams tank in there, as it were. Or if you're in Traveler, you know, Kyle, do we get derelict ships just kind of 
hanging in the void, hatches open, main drive they, they, section. Well, they don't out. mention in books one to three. There's a, there's a couple of adventure modules out there like that. Um, you know, but I mean, uh, yeah, it depends on the players that you've got. Like some players will be all, you know, if you send them to a pl uh, planet where uh, they haven't heard from the colonists for a bit, they go, oh, shit, aliens. You know, like if the players are a bit kind of cynical, they're a bit, you know, gen, a bit uh, Gen X and ironical, then uh, it could be a bit painful. So you, you could be careful about it. like a derelict ship. People are going, oh, so what you're telling me is where we're going, we won't need eyes. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so I, I think, um, yeah, you could put that sort of stuff in, but you have to be a bit careful. And you kind of have to put it in a few times and it's nothing. It's nothing dramatic or horrible before you, mm -hmm. you put it in. It's sort of... Um, yeah, it, I mean, I'm a, as you know, I'm a big believer in plagiarism, but it's like you say about the, um, and the patron betrays you. And it's just it's just so overdone that it's not interesting. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, there are, and there's lots of kind of little cliches out there like that. And it, so it can be hard as a game master because, uh, like, there's so much media and there's so much stuff to consume out there that... Um, even if you think of being completely original, someone else has in fact done it, you know. So it, it's hard to come up with something that won't make some smart ass around the game table go, oh, yes, this was the plot in, in episode 23, season six of Babylon 5 or whatever, you know. It's, it, it, it can be hard like that. Um, but yeah. Yeah. yeah I, so, and so that's why it can be good to have these random charts and just roll things up and, and, let, and see what comes up. Yeah, I, I I don't remember what it was. I I was um, I thought I was running a uh, so kind of one of my first steps out as doing anything other than dungeon mastering, and this would have been 1989, I think, running a BattleTech, the role playing game, uh, so Mech Warrior uh, session with a bunch of guys, and I thought I. I just, I had a crusher of a scenario. So many twists and turns. They'd never <laughs> see this coming. And, I mean, it was all original, all from the mind of Bill Sylvie, and they had unraveled it like 25 minutes in. They were like, well, <laughs> clearly this guy knows the location of the weapons. I mean, you know, and... and But by the same token, you'll have something really simple and obvious, and they'll uh try to make it more complicated than it is. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That that no. Goes back to the room with a bent coin, the potsherds, and the suit of armor, and, you know, suddenly they oh, populated... In one campaign, I, in one no, campaign, I did have a derelict yeah. ship. So th this was um, in Traveller. Uh, so this was an example of a, um, a time when um, they uh, did not start with a ship. Uh, they were all mustered out at this particular planet and they wanted to get off planet, but they had to make some money. Mm -hmm. So there was an archaeologist who was out doing a dig because uh, the story was that uh, uh, when humanity first went to the stars, they didn't use jump drives. They used slower than light ships and everyone was in cold sleep. And so what had happened, you know, so some of those, sometimes when they eventually reached a, star, uh, a planet, with um jump drives they found humans already there that had been there for 100 years or whatever the journey had taken them 500 uh, you know 400 years and then they landed and they colonized for the last 100 years and humanity only really got to the with the jump drive got to it you know just now so mm -hmm. they found that in some instances but it was an archaeological dig she said she believed that uh there was a slower than light ship that had had uh crash landed on this world mm -hmm. And so it was going to, going to tell them some stuff. So we, we, they, the party went along there and they came and they found mm -hmm. that uh, it had a fission drive, not a fusion drive, and this fission drive, the, the, the fission reactor was still going, still doing this little trickle of power 400 years on. The automated okay. systems had kept it going. It was just, just enough power to keep the low the uh, cold sleep tubes going. So there was like 73 people or something 
still alive in the cold sleep tubes from 450 years ago. <laughs> and then it, then the archaeologist who'd led them there said, I'm actually working for this salvage company. But if there are any people still alive on the ship, it's not salvage, it's a rescue mission. And she stood there by the fuse box with a hand on the lever and said, so guys, should it be salvage or a rescue mission? <laughs> and they looked yeah. around at this ship that was going to be worth a lot. And uh, there was the, the habitation module and there was also the shuttle. And they could at least have a shuttle without a jump drive, a spaceship without a jump drive, even if it was hundreds of years old. They could have a free spaceship with 10 million credits or whatever. And they're like, uh, 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 and they're arguing back and forth and that. So it, so that was a derelict craft. That was an adventure with a derelict craft that uh, led them to, do, you know, try to decide what to do. Um, yeah. And so, yeah, it just sort of, um, that op that opened up the universe a bit to say uh, what sort of people are out there in the universe, how ruthless, because like these guys should have been dead 450 years ago, you know. So right. does it matter if they die now? And it's cold sleep. What's their chances of being revived successfully anyway? Especially hundreds of years later, you know. Surely there's a negative to the role then, you know. And, <laughs> well, and then they I, started I, rationalizing whether or not they could flip the switch and... <laughs> Players being players. No, no, nobody tell Ellen Ripley. Yeah, we were going to pull you out, but <laughs> hey, this pod, you know, this is antique. Uh, we could turn this into a racing skiff. Uh, her? Oh, yeah, just, just unplug her. <laughs> yep, pretty much. Yeah, yeah. So it was, it was, it was actually inspired by that scene where mm -hmm. they walk in and then they see her still alive and they say, "There goes our salvage." Yeah, there goes our salvage. Um, yeah. <laughs> Maybe you know, I, had the, morals or something. <laughs> <laughs> that or somebody from the company immediately got on the phone and said, don't you freaking move. <laughs> <laughs> Stay exactly where you are. Don't <laughs> move an inch. <laughs> Gentlemen, here's $150,000 a piece. We were never here. You didn't find a ship. <laughs> or knowing the company, <laughs> knowing Whalen Utani, it was probably more like, hey, why don't you come on over to our ship and we'll discuss this? And they get spaced, you know. <laughs> it did end up being a, a ruthless party of adventurers, though. They oh, didn't, uh, they, they, un they unplugged the them, then, huh? But they, they didn't flick the switch then, but they did some awful things later on. <laughs> ah, yeah. I, I I seem to recall. I, I Which, think you told me about them. Yeah, that, that was. Uh, <laughs> they took like off and because it was a fish and dry. It, it, they took off and so you know all the exhaust went down onto the uh, the habitation area, uh, which also had the the uh, it was a liquid sodium reactor. So oh, no. you know, they applied extreme heat to the outside of a liquid sodium nuclear reactor. <laughs> and they they took off and they landed nearby because they didn't have enough fuel and then the locals were a bit upset that because <laughs> yeah. for that for the locals it was a holy site because there were other ships that had come and established colonies there so for the locals were like these are our ancestors and <laughs> and you just turned it into a radioactive wasteland <laughs> yeah oh my gosh i oh god i can't even imagine um was one of the uh uh if you've ne if you've never read uh joe haldeman's the forever war it's it's a damn fine read uh he he wrote it as a treatise on his experience in vietnam of coming home and re and uh in forever war the uh it is a very physics uh steeped book the sequels increasingly less so but he um light speed travel other than than uh going through naturally occurring white holes 
to get to the other side of the galaxy is done at near relativistic speeds. So there's tremendous time dilation. So when his unit goes off to fight the aliens, um, you know, they're gone for three weeks on a campaign that lasts like 40 minutes. And then they get back on their transport and they come home and like 35 years have passed. <laughs> and the military is like, you know, this culture shock must be pretty, pretty bad for you guys. Uh, home doesn't seem like home anymore. And you kind of feel estranged and lots of your loved ones and family. Well, they're no longer with us. You've always got a home with the army, you know. <laughs> Just saying. My and question so every, is, do they get paid for them? Do they get paid for those six weeks or do they get paid for the 35 years? That's one of the things it, it, that, that comes up. They get paid for that for that time, for, for the actual amount of time that they're gone relative to Earth. And by the end of the book, some of the war veterans have bought a planet. They they literally <laughs> buy a planet to use. Now, now the, the veterans are still in their early 20s that you know they've aged three years but you know people are like, oh god they got, these guys are fossils these are relics they, you know these people are like i think by the end of the book it's the late 39th century and and they're like yeah we're just we're still kids and people are like no no you're you're old weirdos you know you have weird ideas about <laughs> Uh, about you know <laughs> concepts about human mores and that sort of thing. So if you want to go live on your on your retirement planet, that's fine. You just you just go. You you, you can have it. So they uh, they named the planet Middle Finger. Um, <laughs> but Haldeman wrote it about the estrangement that he felt when he would when he went to Vietnam, and as was the case with a lot of soldiers, you know you you go to Vietnam and in in a 24 hour period, once you got your return home orders, you might have to go out the base that you're at. Uh, you might have to go out on patrol in a hostile zone. The base that you're at might come under attack. And then you're like, Hey, it's, you know, it's, it's Wednesday. It's seven o'clock. There's a supply helicopter coming in, in like 20 minutes. It's, you know, it's like 20 minutes out. You're done. Get on it and go back to this large base and then you'll take a bus to Saigon and then you'll take a flight to Guam and, you know, just blah, blah, blah. And, and in the space of 30 hours, guys that were in serious life or death combat are back home in Abilene or Montgomery or Jacksonville or New York. You know, it's just. And that sense of separation that he would feel when he would when he did a couple of tours in Vietnam is what prompted him to write it. And also uh, talking about, um, cause he had read Starship Troopers and it's a very different book. Starship Troopers is pretty much world war two mm. in space and the forever war is Vietnam in space. Um, although uh, Robert A. Heinlein loved the forever war by all accounts said this, this is like one of the best space war stories I've ever written. It's better than Starship Troopers, he even felt. But um, the point of all this brouhaha is that at some point in the book, the 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 space marines um, or space army guys realize that, hey, wait a minute, we don't really have to do anything. We just have to fly over the enemy and turn our engines on full blast because <laughs> it's a nuclear-powered spacecraft. So it's just going to fly over and bathe them all in ionizing radiation. It's as effective as any bomb we could drop, and they do. And uh, mm -hmm. it, uh, it it does what it does. So yeah, yeah. There's some uh, there's some sci-fi law like that named after someone or other who came up with it, saying any interesting drive technology, yeah, so useful, and interesting. Any interesting drive technology is also a, a weapon of mass destruction. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was mentioning this the the other night. I it's, I don't think you were uh, you were on the stream, but I, I was talking about this. There's a um, Project Orion, which was a serious proposal mm. in the 1960s to power a spacecraft by farting nuclear bombs out the back. Because <laughs> each explosive pulse in orbit 
would push the craft forward and mm. in space a perfect just the takeoff from earth is the problem yeah yeah it, it was the 30 nuclear bombs uh you'd have to detonate in our atmosphere uh to to get your ship into orbit um but... well that's a problem for the uh for um the interesting technology of the the rosinante as well because uh 96.8 terawatts works out to be the equivalent of a 23 kiloton nuclear bomb going off every second so it's basically hiroshima or nagasaki every second yeah <laughs> so, <laughs> um uh, yeah so uh, i i would propose a different sort of drive for the takeoff from a planet and uh... <laughs> the shuant drive <laughs> yeah, something like that. Yeah, but a, a yeah, different there, one for the takeoff from a planet. Uh, there, and I don't know how it would be if it's a fusion explosion with EMP and all the rest. You know, so at what point do they can they kick in with their regular drive in that? And I would just hand wave it and say fifty kilometers or something up. But you know, yeah. <laughs> I, I mean, there there is a point, and I'm sorry, hard science fiction authors out there who, you know, uh, who. Th- pat yourselves on the back that no my space travel is realistic and you know blah 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 and but you've still got like city-sized colony ships and all that shit um it's magic okay it's as magic as george lucas's spaceship that fly in gentle curves despite there being no atmosphere and make whooshing sounds despite there being no atmosphere it's just as magic to say that your you know kilometer long colony ship can lift up off of a planet because once you start doing the math everything falls apart (laughs) (laughs) yeah yeah i mean there are some good books out there there's um uh one called delta v where uh, a guy decides okay let's get asteroid mining happening um Mm -hmm. and he sends a craft up there to to mine an asteroid and bring back heaps of palladium and all that sort of stuff um and uh, that's got pretty good hard science. You know, there's, there's, the people have health problems and um, fight amongst themselves and all the rest. Uh, yeah, he, so he, he goes into all the, you know, having the, the rotating habitat so they've got some gravity and uh, all the rest because they're out there for years. Um, the, the problem is that this, and it's also economically realistic because in the story, um, the, the eccentric billionaire who sends them off there, he's put in so much money to the project and they're still out there still mining and the money's not coming in that people start calling in debts so it starts to become um, a, a serious risk that they'll just get left out there because <laughs> <laughs> he, he hadn't he hadn't yet funded the backup ship that was going to fly out there and bring them fuel to take them home <laughs> so then they start thinking about doing this big you know orbital spiraling path to get back home and calculating but will there be enough air for us and all the rest <laughs> yikes so it's economically realistic too <laughs> you know that that it reminds me we we tend to think that we don't in real life have cool science fictiony things happen to to astronauts which i dispute uh, uh greatly you know i i think about um you know uh how how much more fantastical do you want than Gagarin's orbit by himself in the absolute void of space? I mean, there's not another satellite up there. There's not there. There's it's just me, uh, you know, the the loneliest man to ever exist. You know, when when it comes to being near near uh, anything man made other than a ship. Um, but another one uh, that involved a Soviet was. Uh, there was a Soviet astronaut who, for a very brief period, uh, well, I guess I should say cosmonaut, uh, there was a cosmonaut um, who, for a brief period, uh, was stuck without, he, he had no national identity. Because while he was in space, the Soviet Union ceased to exist. Mm-hmm. <laughs> he went into space as a Soviet citizen. And until the Russian Federation finalized its its new uh, constitution and and so on, this guy sitting up there like I'm a stateless person in space. And I mean, how many 
you know how, how many uh cool science fiction stories have have uh have revolved i, I wonder around... um i think there was two or three of them actually on the mere space station but, what uh, was it what, i was wonder it? If okay were, i think it was two uh, um but i do wonder whether they thought at the time am i going to go be able to get back to earth because they they could just jump in boss in their spare soils and go but who knows where they land and who knows if anyone picks them up they don't necessarily yeah. just want to land in a random part of the pacific you know um because they might not survive long enough to get picked up it, it yeah. requires like an enormous amount you know like i was thinking of this the other day but reading about the uh plans to ditch the international space station um and thinking you know couldn't an eccentric billionaire take it over and it's like well not really because you know there's so much support down on the ground that is required mm -hmm. and and so many different very specialized people you know yes literally thousands of people are involved in keeping it going you can't just get that up and going overnight it's a really you know, um yeah it's a really tough thing yeah and i've i've talked about this before in 2003 i worked for nasa um and i i worked in the space station uh production facility and they were you know laptops were set up there and i i didn't handle any of these myself i mean by the time you start talking about put this on a cargo ship to the space station it's well beyond you know a jumper monkey like me um but you know laptops were being sent up there that ran windows nt4 which uh for those of you who don't know it's it's a circa 1996 version of the windows operating system you have now um and it was very specialized and i am sure it required very very special uh uh adaptations of of libraries and individual executable programs and so on and etc um and uh you know I, I i think about this so so you're a rich billionaire you know the russians leave the americans leave the japanese leave the canadians leave and it's sitting up there and you're like wait don't crash it i'm going to spend uh you know the dick <laughs> ship or or a spacex up to it and dock with it and it'll be my hotel in space okay um we've shut off our legacy end of it nobody here knows how to maintain those systems up there that are running minix and windows nt4 and yeah we ran out of spares for those a long time ago and it's not like like <laughs> down here oh crap i have to update to windows 10. <laughs> no your your laptop is almost 30 years old and it runs a vital subsystem of that space station you're not updating anything so you're absolutely yeah. right there is no i'll just pick it up with to to go way way back to what you were saying about tanks earlier it's i i think a lot of people are like yeah, if I hit the lottery, man, I buy me a I buy me a Sherman tank, <laughs> dude. Just because it has an internal combustion engine and a driver's seat, you don't <laughs> have what it takes to keep that thing going. Can you tension a track three or four times a day? You know what? What do you do when the intercooler springs a leak and the engine locks up, and you're out on your back 40, 20 miles from home, and it just quits? You can't call AAA, and I don't think Chilton's <laughs> makes a manual for. Yeah, the, I was uh, I was talking to a cavalry guy I know a game with online, and uh, you know, and I said, "What do you guys spend most of your time doing?" And he said, "Well, maintenance." And, <laughs> and yeah. uh, I said, "Yeah, it's very different in the infantry, and he's, you know, because you, you got nothing to maintain except your rifle, and that's the simplest a machine can be and still be a machine." He says the bolt that goes back and forth. You know, it's um, and, uh, unless you want to call a spanner a machine or something. Um, no, I guess I guess you know technically this is a machine. Or, um, yeah, or the simple this wedge. Is a machine, <laughs> technically, um, technically, but uh, yeah, but a rifle with a, 
a bolt going back and forth is technically a machine. Um, so it doesn't take much maintenance. Um, uh, whereas your armored vehicles do. And he said, so what did, what do you do all the time in infantry? And I said, a lot of inspections and a lot of running around. And he said, so basically, like he said, we do one physical training session a day. You did two. And I said, yeah. <laughs> so we did, you know, a lot of running and, and push-ups and stuff. Other units do as well. Um, I, I have a, a very good friend who was a, a signal in um, uh, the first signals. I don't know what they call it, battalion, regiment, whatever it was, squadron mm -hmm. or something. One sig, um, and occasionally every unit. Yeah, you know you've got that in the US thing that every Marine's a rifleman. And you're like, well, not really. Let's be honest, you know. Yeah. Um, um, if you're a cook or a clerk or something, you know, you're probably, you know, not that hardcore. Yeah. Let's be honest. Um, well, you can appreciate the esprit de corps of, you know, if the shit goes down, you know which end of, of this long thing the bullets come out of. But yeah, yeah. But, you know, being realistic, all the macho talk aside, being realistic. Um, yeah, but every unit, whatever their, uh, specialty occasionally we'll have a commander who comes through and, and gets a sort of a bee in their bonnet about it and says we're, we're going to be hardcore we are going to be like the every marines are right from the peak so they start having everyone do a, a lot more range firing shoots uh you know a lot more running around and everything so much so that uh, one sig became run sig yes <laughs> that's what it became known as as they started they spent so much time running the poor bastards and then the commander changed and things settled down again you know because <laughs> yeah. in the end like half of them are the the nickname for them in um the commonwealth armies is uh, the chooks and the geeks the chooks comes from the uh, chickens uh, from the old morse code thing like pecking right and the uh geeks is the, the guys who are using these a laptop um i'm sure yeah. there must be some other terms but i don't know them yeah, the chooks thing. So, like, they're just sitting at a laptop all day. You know, they, this guy could be three hundred pounds. It doesn't matter. You know, it's <laughs> yeah, <coughs> yeah. Funny, funny, strange stuff. And I, I think people don't realize how I've known enough people and things you've told me. The military is just as prone to the ebb and flow of moods and attitudes as anything in civilian life you know yeah, you have an a-hole bureaucratic... yeah you it's have an a-hole boss for six pressure. months you know your boss the, the boss you have for six months is an a-hole then he gets moved to another position and the guy that comes in is less of an a-hole yeah. in civilian life and in real life so yeah but anyway yeah, and you know you know that's it's just a large bureaucratic organization and, and they're all a bit silly. So, <laughs> so um, to continue the silliness, uh, tomorrow night, now, uh, not silly, but uh, speaking of military things, Michael C., who, uh, I, don't, I, I don't know if you, be, if, if you and I had talked about this, but Michael will be here. Uh, he is a war gamer and he is an author. Uh, he, he, he definitely has some nuts and bolts, uh, military background, uh, on the tabletop that he will discuss with us. So Michael C, uh, author of Wargamer will be, uh, guesting on the show tomorrow night and then Friday night, a little bit of chatter and a whole lot of gamma world. That's right. We're going to go back to the radioactive biological mutated horror that is gamma world and see how many more characters I can pinch in half with security doors. Uh, <laughs> next week, uh, next week, Kyle, and I, 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 I would love it, uh, if you could be there, you know, we'll, we'll see if we can work out the time, but, uh, RPG Elite will be here. That's right. He's going to be guest. Servant of show. Shiloh. Servant of, Sir he is at pains to say that his non the internet is Servant of Shiloh. I don't know servant why of I'm going to ask him about that. And, um, Good. but his channel is RPG Elite. Yes, uh, and uh, check him out on YouTube, RPG Elite he's, on he's, YouTube. He's a great, he seems to be a great guy, and his uh, like, channel has really exploded in, uh, yes. in membership. <laughs> it's like 5,000 followers or something now. 
awesome it, it, it is. It's awesome. He's, he's, he's got a great little channel and he deserves every bit of that. So uh, I just want to take a quick minute before you go, because I know you have got to split out of here. First of all, thank you for everyone who's supporting us on Patreon. That is awesome. It helps keep the light on, as it were. Uh, but also, I want to take a moment to thank Digital Discord, Joshua Garlic, Lord Corion, Ricky Maru, Mobius, Kevin Reynolds, Joseph Lucas, Doomsword Deathmaster, Mark Simpson, Simpson, Damian247, James F. Keck, William Smith, the Dungeon Minister, have a safe drive home, Padre, and of course, Manny Wall. So thank you to our Patreons. Thank you to everyone who watched the show tonight. Uh, love you all. Seriously. Kyle, thank you for being here. And we'll see you next week. Yes? Thank you. All righty. Every, everybody have a wonderful evening. And we'll see you then. Peace out. <laughs>